on this episode of Skeptico, a show about the darkness and light of sexuality. I just decided to focus on sexuality because there is so much darkness around it. So I said, okay, why don't I address it? Why don't I bring it into light? Like they wanted to demean, for example, Mary Magdalene and other goddesses. And then my question is, why? There must be some liberating power in it and we have to claim it, but in our own way, not through darkness, but through light. And why we might want to always be suspicious of spiritual intermediaries. I, as an ordained person with an indelible mark, can make Holy Communion is what separates you from me. So, for instance, if you're gay and you're not absolutely chaste and celibate, you can't go to communion. If you vote for somebody who uh, approves of abortion, you can't go to communion, according to some. So it's become a uh, a kind of a, a politicized reward for thinking the right way. Stick around for my interview with the very excellent Dr. Joanna Kawave. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome Dr. Joanna Kawave to Skeptico. She's here to talk about this book that I've pulled up on the screen, Mary Magdalene and the Goddesses of Eros and Secret Knowledge. Joanna, it's awesome to have you here. Thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. Thank you, Alex. I'm delighted to be here with you. Well, you know, we'll see what you say at the end. (laughs) I'm sure we'll have a discussion. I'm sure we will. You know, I've been looking forward to this, and the more I've dug into the book, the more I've really thought about so many things that I'd love to share and talk, and we've got some good emails back and forth. And I think we'll have a fun spirited discussion, but a positive one. I, like I said, you are my Dharma sister, man. You're Aww. into yoga. You're into spirituality. You're into all this cool stuff. Tell us a little bit about your background. I, I'm going to read a little bit before you do. I'm going to interrupt okay. that. I'm going to short circuit that excellent bio. People can check out your website. And if they do, they'll check out this very cool bio about Dr. Joanna and read a bunch of stuff. And there's a little bit that I pulled out of there that I thought was really cool. Although through my university education, I was groomed to be a Catholic intellectual, the story I was told made less and less sense. I subscribe to no religion, and yet I'm a passionate believer in spiritual evolution at the presence of spirituality in all aspects of our lives. Ooh, I love that, rich spiritual lives. Not rigid, fear-based religion, but spirituality which expands by embracing every aspect of our humanity and making it divine. This calls for redefining spirituality and freeing it from old constraints and limitations imposed by past cultural conditioning. How beautiful. Ah, thank you. <laughs> but it's true. It's true for all of us, I think, for many of us. For I call myself a spiritual detective, but I think it's probably uh, true about every sincere spiritual seeker, right? Like we, we know that you are more than we are told that we are by by I would argue, I don't know if it's controversial on this show or not, by by all traditional religions, you know, they instead of uplifting us, you know, they in some ways try to stop our spiritual evolution. However, they did some good things, such as I would argue, they preserved certain sacred writings for us, you know. But I think that we should be able to interpret them ourselves, right? And and take something from there. That, that, you know, the hidden truth, sometimes in between lines. So it requires more effort than just going to church, right? It requires passion and, and commitment. You know what, let's, let's take what you just said, which is quite, quite beautiful, quite, you know, controversial to some, but to others, it's just second nature, and mm-hmm. connect that for us to the book. Okay, so I actually, um, 
it uh, I'm uh, at the moment uh, for last 16 years I've been living in Australia and I before in Canada and in Paris but I'm originally from Poland and I was brought up in a interesting environment because in Poland everybody it was a communist regime but everybody was also Catholic, deeply Catholic, like the very medieval version of Catholicism, you know, like what people believe in the 14th century, people believed in the 20th century in, in the Poland I lived, right? It's changing now. So, you know, as a little girl, I was going to church, you know, normal, right? And there are some beautiful Baroque churches in my hometown. And I always, you know, I noticed that, you know, the divine feminine was definitely worshipped in Poland because Virgin Mary is the main deity. You know, like this is what she represents, basically religion almost there. And, and I saw this, you know, this beautiful paintings of Virgin Mary on one side, but I noticed that there is this other woman. Yes. So it's, it's um, Black Madonna of Częstochowa. You know, she's actually called the Queen of Poland. So she's just like the main deity there. My grandmother went on foot, you know, for hundreds of kilometers, you know, to, to see the painting on the top of the mountain. You know, it, it is the whole medieval thing, right? And, and so, so this is her. And then I noticed that in uh, hidden in the naves of the church, there, was, uh, there were paintings of this other woman you know, and it was the, pain, the, the paintings of Mary Magdalene, right, or Mary Magdalene, and that she was, I had this um, sense that she was somehow close to Jesus, or she was close to the teacher, as I call him now, and, 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 but there was something shameful, shameful about her, you know, but also something very fascinating, and I didn't understand it then, but I thought that we have this strange polarity in our minds, you know, especially with the respect to feminine, which is basically, you know, either there's this mother figure, which is completely pure and, you know, asexual and, uh, and, you know, very beautiful archetype, but also very limiting, you know, like you can be that, and this is the only way to be. And there was this other archetype that was kind of demeaned, but it was very fascinating. So eventually many years after that, I started to explore this archetype uh, that I think that Mary Magdalene, you know, embodies and looked into goddesses that perhaps came before her or were other embodiments of the same archetype. And I started to look into also her sexuality because I thought that, you know, I started to notice that, you know, Mary Magdalene most likely was never a prostitute, you know, and even the Catholic church admitted in 1969, but, you know, not, not many people know that, that they did that. And I wondered why she was so pushed into the uh, to the margins, you know, why she was demeaned uh, on the one hand, especially in the Orthodox tradition, Eastern Orthodox tradition, she's like the apostle of apostles. On the other hand, you know, she's this penitent prostitute and it just didn't agree with me somehow, the whole story, somehow I didn't think that she was a prostitute. And then somehow on the way, I also discovered the Gnostic teachings, the Gnostic gospels, and, and uh, Gnostic writings, not only the Gospels, and went into this and I realized that she was also portrayed as, in, in some of them, as the favorite disciple of, of, of Jesus. So what a fascinating person, right? At the same time, on my own personal journey, I just don't want to confuse anybody here, I, I started to, because when I moved away from Catholicism, I started to look for other options like, you know, most people do when they give up their original religion. And I started to move towards esoteric Hinduism. And I started to be interested in what is now called tantric teacher teachings, but it had nothing to do at first with sexuality, but rather with a teaching that everything is consciousness, everything is divine. And I thought, wow, it's very interesting because especially as sexuality uh, is being portrayed by the modern media and through centuries is very much demeaned, right? And here, sexuality is also a form of divinity and and we actually can uh, arrive at the expansion of consciousness be one with the divine through erotic rapture and i thought how beautiful and how different from what we are being normally told uh, especially by by media and uh, also you know women had very little sexual freedom but men had more sexual freedom, but they were also not taught how to honor their sexuality, 
right? It's always something dark in us. And I think we have to uplift it. So that's why I started to, you know, uh, do this investigative work in my book, The Other Goddess, how to uplift it, why, why we are being told that such an integral part of who we are is so dark. And I just, 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 to, just to say, I, I know that there's a dark part to it because uh, there's a dark part to everything, right? But why do we have to focus on this dark part? Why don't we learn how we can uplift it and honor this? You know, in a way that honors us and our divinity and the spirit within us. Great. So would you say that that's more or less the main thing that you want people to take away from the book? I mean, it, the, the book is written for who? I know women will connect with the book because it, it kind of is offering a reinterpretation, probably a more accurate interpretation of what that feminine sexuality that we all understand. I mean, we all understand intuitively that there's something about life and death with that feminine mm. energy. And we understand that sexuality is tied into that in a way that, you know, scares us, especially for men, but at the same time, <laughs> intrigues us, drives us. Um, yeah. Is that, how does that connect though with this, experience that we were talking about before of being that young woman in a Catholic church in a military, a communist Poland and seeing there's more, there's more for me on a very practical level. And then more for me, maybe on this spiritual level and more for me on this sexuality, who I am level that are all trying to be defined. So you're wrapping all that together in the book but is that what how do i distill that down from the book okay so i also partially it is also especially at the end when i try to bring it all together it is about getting out of the matrix so to speak you know realization that we are living this different uh, uh, paradigms that are imposed upon us and it is basically it should be a choice you know it should be almost a, a spiritual duty to take the i say at the end of the book you know turn make a turn, make a turn now. And I was actually thinking about this film, you know, old film, uh, Midnight Express, do you remember this? And when he's at a certain moment when all prisoners walk in one direction and this is what we do, and we've done it for millennia, and at certain point something clicks in his mind and he starts to walk in the opposite direction. And I think this opposite direction is actually the direction of spirituality of true spirituality, of uh, not allowing anyone to brainwash us, to, to explore, you know, to, to go with your spiritual experience, even if sometimes, you know, it can be scary. Because my experience is that it completely rewired me. And I was at the beginning after the or initial ecstasy, you know, I thought like, wow, now what am I going to do now? Everything that was important for me is less important now. <laughs> you know and i'm an ambitious person or used to be and now I, I i'm just kind of going on this different path but i think that we are all especially in times like ours you know called to take take the different turn so you know you just kind of mentioned there but people who check out the book will find that you're you're very self-disclosing very open oh, in yes. some way in some ways that will be surprising the book is a tiny bit spicy i mean you know and what did you think about doing that what did you think about presenting it that way and i think that in a way i took that as a statement about everything you're saying that you can talk about your sexuality along with being a religious scholar along with being all this other stuff and you can just kind of put it out there in a kind of unapologetic way and also in a way that doesn't seem to be spun you know it just seems to be kind of this is it this is kind of what happened yes thank you thank you for this and it's true it doesn't mean actually the writing of it was easy but publishing it and now it's like all out there you know this is joanna and, and her experiences it, it you know it 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 was not so easy, you know, I, I'm still sweating when I think about it, you know, because there can be a reaction, there can be a backlash. But when at the end of the book, I say, you know, make the turn, uh, I'm sharing my turn, 
right? Like, so this is, I, you have to be honest with your spiritual experience. And this is what my spiritual experience was with relationship to, uh, in relation to sexuality, right? Although I had other experiences not related to sexuality, but the ones that I focus in the book, just for the purpose of the book, you know, do focus on sexuality. So I thought you, I have to be honest. I'm asking my readers to be honest. I'm completely honest. This is, you know, I'm as naked as possible, right? <laughs> in, in, in this part of the book, which is the first part of the book. That's why in some interviews I said, if you just want to know about Mary Magdalene and not about my experiences, go to part two, right? Because the part one can shake you a little bit if you, if you don't want to go there. But I also, for many years, studied uh, Tantra with Tantric scholars, with Sanskrit scholars. And in the book, I describe uh, one of the uh, regular meetings that I had, you know, the Sanskrit scholar, who, by the way, is also a Catholic priest, is an interesting, and, and PhD in Sanskrit, but completely into Tantra, with a Buddhist monk who escaped Tibet, and now he has his own successful center in Melbourne, Australia. And, and, with, and with another independent Swami from, uh, from Adelaide he, in, in, in Australia. And we were going, you know, through this tantric test, text, which is the most controversial of all of them, from uh, 10th century uh, Indian philosopher Abhinava Gupta, who actually wrote it down. It's from Tantra Loka, which is the light on, ta on the tantras. And chapter 29 is about Kula ritual, which is the sexual ritual in Tantra. Very controversial ritual. And, you know, and as I was uh, sitting there with, with this man and we are just, you know, everything was proper. We are proper scholars, not, nobody, you know, nothing happened. And I thought that it was so lifeless, you know, like this, this, this we are just reading this and it's just, and it's encoded. So, so it's difficult to understand because, you know, the philosopher himself didn't want, you know, people just to go there and do it, right? Because you, you should be, you know, have a focus on expansion of consciousness when you perform the ritual. And I thought it was so lifeless, you know, and this scholar, and it's just so dry, you know, and I, and I thought, no, we have to, uh, I'm all about spiritual experience, right? So I didn't want to write this kind of book. That's why it's not an academic book. I wanted to write a book that is an easy read, that is entertaining, and it's completely honest. So in, in this part of the book, I do actually it described my own tantric experience, which was very spontaneous. And I call it an act of grace because I'm not a tantric teacher. So I don't even know how to repeat this experience. It just happened to me. But according to the tantric scriptures, I fulfilled the criteria, you know, at this particular moment. So I just met with a man and, and, uh, and uh, I was just getting over a significant relationship and, you know, and it just happened. And it was a mind blowing experience, you know, what happened. Actually, I felt, um, and so did he, because I can't, according to this tantric teaching, a woman is a conduit for the energy to move. And then the energy spills on the man. And he was just, fortunately, he was a spiritual man. So he knew what was happening, right? But my whole body was act actually lit up. And I felt the movement of energy from my body. And some people ask me, if, if you don't mind, to be a little bit graphic, how do you know that it wasn't just an orgasm? <laughs> right? And I said, because it was a conscious energy. Like I could feel that something like in tantric teachers, teachings, they talk about Kundalini energy, anything like yeah, 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 yoga stuff. And then you feel it. And it's just something at the, you know, it, wakes up in you it's completely conscious it is you it is like your higher self but it's like you that you even didn't know you know that you have and it consciously starts to move through your body energetically and you know it first blew up in my heart and this is when i lit up and spilled on the man and he was just like wow right and then you know it went right to my forehead and then it just paused in a very intelligent way and decided to move like in one particular direction. And it was an experience that lasted several months when I actually couldn't almost function because I actually didn't see the material world. I saw like particles and energy around me. And in the meantime, I had to like finish my PhD and so on. It was like, you know, it was completely unreal because I was transported somewhere else. And I was given this beautiful vision, I think of an energetic universe really, right? So, but it did happen through sexual experience. And uh, 
and just like it was described, you know, in, in, in the scriptures. But uh, so I thought like, I have to share this kind of experience. Otherwise people get this kind of neo-tantra, you know, what do you do, you know, say some mantras, do some breathing, uh, like, I don't know, it would, yeah. it's sure you can try. Or, you know, they get this dry academic text, then, you know, does, even, even if you are an academic like me, I still thought like, you know, like that, it's supposed to be a erotic rapture that takes you to, you know, higher consciousness. And this is just like, it couldn't be more boring, you know, the way <laughs> academics write about it. So I thought the only way to actually do it differently, it's to share my own experience. Great, brave, brave, brave <laughs> to do that. But but here is, this is such a great point now, because now we're going to talk skeptico. Mm -hmm. This is the fun part, because I'm with you. And I think that's, again, awesome that you can share that. And I think a lot of people can, can find benefit to that, because you're right, the neo-tantric thing just gets so played out in one way or another, or just, hey, here's a way to hook up with somebody in a new way, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you're really, obviously, you're reaching for something much more than that. And, uh, and as you say, it, it was spontaneous. It isn't, it even wasn't like you were sitting there, you know, just make trying to make it happen. It, it more you were putting yourself in a position where it could happen. But here's the skeptical part. Mm -hmm. So we've had this nice email exchange and Ivan sent you this survey and you were nice enough to answer the survey. <laughs> and one of the questions was religion. And you chose the answer, my favorite answer, mm -hmm. unnecessary intermediary. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what it is, right? So when you were that girl, that young woman in Poland and you're looking at the Madonna and I didn't realize she's like the saint of Poland and she's got scars on her face, you know, yeah. and she looks very, very troubled, you know, and isn't it interesting yeah. as a whole culture, a whole country to take on? Why was that who you would adopt? But anyways, that's what it is. Yeah. But what do we do with the fact that it's unnecessary? If it truly is unnecessary, we can process that in a couple of different ways. One, you processed it personally as this might not be necessary, or it might not be the way I heard you say it in the story, because on your website, also, there's this nice little mini documentary that was done about your immigration experience in Australia. Mm -hmm. People can check it out, and it's great. But I saw that as kind of a personal challenging of is this necessary? Must I suffer like the Virgin Mary? No, mm -hmm. I can do more. As a woman, I'm intelligent. I know I'm smart. I can go. I can learn. I can go to Paris. I can go to all these different places. I can do things. What an awesome thing. At the same time, I wonder if you, how you process the kind of challenging that necessariness on the institutional level. Because if we're going to really tear that down, what is necessary about Catholicism? If we look at all the nasty, horrible, evil things that have been done by that institution, and now we're going to open up the possibility that they're not necessary in order to connect with the divine, that has huge implications. So that I think is kind of the starting point, but you know where I'm coming with the next part is what's necessary about Tantra. But to get there, I want to start with, you know, isn't that your answer? Your answer? You gave the right answer, in my opinion. What is religion? Okay. It's an unnecessary intermediary. Mm. How far so, can that take us? Okay, we don't know. It's as far as a human and divine potential within us. And I think what it takes, it's really, I'm not as interested in dismantling any institutions, I think they will die of natural death. You know, if we do not give them energy, if we do not support them, you know, they will die of natural death. But I think we have to focus on our own individual, which if enough individuals focus on it, it will become also a collective spiritual journey. You know, so you have to, we all have to be absolutely brave, you know, wherever this spiritual journey takes us. And, 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 and we just, and we just go there, 
And then we realize, you know, that what we're taught is not true. And it was not easy for me. You know, I was brought up as a good Catholic girl. So just going against it, you know, it was going against every fiber in my body, you know, and especially that I studied at the Pontifical Institute and I was everybody's favorite, you know, I was this smart Catholic girl and, you know, everybody loved me. I had a fantastic experience as a student. You know what I mean? Like, it was like all the doors were open. If I stayed there, you know, I could go to... One regret I have is that I didn't go to the Vatican Library, you know, because I would have this kind of opportunities, you know, to study in the library and see what's actually there. So it wasn't easy. But then it was another realization that happened that has nothing to do with Tantra. When I was sitting in a church and thinking like, you know, I am a sinner, forgive me. And I had this, I'm not a sinner. You know, why do I have to start from this sinner point of view? You know, what if I am a divine being? You know, who wants me to be the sinner? And actually, you know, in, in, in Gnostic Gospels, I think it's in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, when I think Peter asked a teacher, tell us about the sin. And, and, and the teacher, Jesus says, there is no sin. And then he explains what he means by that, right? We just deal with the consequences of our lower choices, basically. And so... Uh, this getting away from the institutions for me is an individual act of supreme spiritual rebellion. And if enough people do this, the institutions will not survive. Right. So I'm not yeah, I mean, that. that's but come on, you, you don't you you've written a book about Mary Magdalene. Why yes. do we why by propping up these different figures within this phony institution? How does mm -hmm. that help mm. us. I mean, if it's purely a, a, a kind of metaphor, a story that we can use, uh, great. But it, it always becomes more than that. It always, like in the book, when you even talk about other goddesses like Isis, you'll talk about. Mm. And then you'll say, you know, even the early Christian fathers of the early church couldn't dismiss it. Again, we're, we're propping up what we either have to it seems to me like we either have to bring down the scaffolding and bring it all the way down and build it back up and say, okay, what is the reality of that history? How are we supposed to understand it? And then build our understanding of where you're jumping to the end and say, divinity is everywhere. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's at the tip of our nose. It's in everything. It's on everything. So then I think the question becomes, how do you wind up to be that young woman in that church individually but collectively how do we all wind up being that person in that church because we all are i mean these institutions are have enormous influence i was brought up in greek orthodox church i looked at the same kind of iconography mm -hmm. uh the incense you know go kiss the father's hand and get mind control i mean if we're really going to be honest yeah. about it that is mind control for a six, seven year old kid. Don't we need to, it's, it's one thing to say, gee, if we don't give it any energy, it'll die. Hey, it's been going for thousands of years and it hasn't <laughs> stopped. I, I completely get your point, but I think we are all collectively evolving spiritually. So if we take each of us takes this different turn, then there is no chance for them. And you say, and it's a fair question that I actually didn't consider before. Why discuss, you know, Mary Magdalene, which is a part of the, you know, Catholic routine or Christian routine. But I wanted to say that even I see her as she was just framed, you know, it's a particular, uh, particular archetype and they framed her in a particular way because she was somehow dangerous. And I think if she's dangerous, perhaps you can learn something from her. Do you understand? She, she, I believe that, you know, uh, whether historic, she's historical or not, she's an archetype of some particular expression of walking away from brainwashing, you know? And in Gnostic uh, writings, she's the one, you know, like that, that, you know, Peter represents, uh, you know, the church and all, uh, corporations, right? Like he just says, like Peter in, is that, and 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 he doesn't understand, you know, why she's favored by by the teacher, and 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 she represents for me, uh, uh, she represents for me this walking away. Like she she didn't build the church the way Peter did or Paul did. She just went to, she just went to the wilderness, or you know, I have my own theories, you know, which I just enjoyed exploring, but she is really about gnosis, about the inner 
inner knowing, you know, ex exploring your divine potential. So that's why I thought like, so I'm not buying into the Catholic or Orthodox Mary Magdalene. I said, what this archetype really suggests? And for me, she represents this rebellion against the structure. And that's fine. That's great. And I think the archetypal, metaphorical, you know, Joseph Campbell kind of you reference in there mm -hmm. kind of thing. Hey, awesome. And that can be fulfilling to you, you know, spiritually, and maybe you can in, mm -hmm. inform and, and motivate other people. But at some level, there's a, there's a truth there that underpins that, that has to be understood, I think, before we can go any further you know one of the things we were kind of bouncing around about kind of in a i was halfway kidding but halfway serious was you know the damien eccles and the mitch horowitz thing so it's like mm -hmm. the, the damien eccles thing is kind of much more relevant to your work in a way that takes about four jumps for people to get to so damien eccles is west memphis three Johnny Depp gets him out of prison. They do this documentary and he gets released from prison. He was a guy who, along with two of his friends, they raped and then murdered these three little kids. These kids are eight, nine, 10 years old. They were convicted of that by two different juries. They were never exonerated. That's a misunderstanding people have, but they were released through a deal with the Arkansas, you know, I had had them for 20 years and was unsure whether they could overcome it in another retrial. So anyways, but the reason why he raped and killed those three little kids was revealed by Damien when the police interrogated him. The police did a good trick. This is the trick that police around the world do. They said, yeah. Damien, we know you didn't do this crime, but who did it? And the first thing he goes, well, satanic. He goes, I think it was satanic because, you know, they urinated in the kids' mouths and they did some other things, which no one knew about. They hadn't released or anything. So he's kind of like all good police detectives are looking for someone to give him information that implicates himself, it, which he did. But I'm kind of diving around the point there. The reason that he chose to murder this eight-year-old kid and to perform this sex act on him was because he was a he was trying to do sex magic and this was the sex magic that his inspiration alistair crowley had laid out in his books and he said the most preferred object of your sex magic would be a young boy about eight years old right that's what he said so the point then becomes is that real is that somehow connected to the same wisdom of the Hindu tantric tradition? Or is it just some messed up kid in Arkansas who reads some book? Well, we, we can't really dismiss that way either because Aleister Crowley was for real about it. I mean, anyone who reads the Aleister Crowley biography knows he was doing all that stuff. And he was probably doing the stuff with kids and maybe it even went as far as Damien did. But they were doing that in an effort to tap into that same energy you're talking about. Now, they're tapping into it in a very different way, in a negative way, which raises a whole bunch of questions. But the question then becomes, is it necessary? Is that what's necessary? He thought it was necessary. Aleister Crowley had convinced him that that was necessary ritual in order to tap into that energy so when we get into sex magic it's very very tricky and can go very very dark mm. no that's a legitimate question alex thank you so and it's not easy to deal with so uh it's not necessary to do this right uh, there are methods each method has a dark side to this and unfortunately i think it is i don't understand why people focus on this kind of method you can achieve uh, uh, expansion of consciousness, not only through Tantra and not only through this style, I wouldn't even call it Tantra, you know, through this kind of experiences, uh, but there are other ways of achieving it. But I, I see because there is a dark side to it. I do not explore it. I just very briefly mentioned about, you know, the dark side of this. I decided to cut it out. 
you know, because I think there's enough focus on this. But what you're saying, I don't know enough about this man, but if he indeed did it and, you know, and if it is indeed proved, then this is... Uh, this is horrible misuse, you know, and I understand that this is a dangerous path. And that's why some of this works, like for example, Kula Ritual and uh, um, uh, chapter 29, it was really written, not only that it was written in Sanskrit, which was, you know, obviously uh, the educated language at the time in, in India, but it was written in, in coding because only people who were chosen by a, evolved teacher would be allowed to do this isn't that starting to sound a lot like that guy in the vatican who wears that crazy hat and turns out a yeah. lot of his people like to rape, rape little kids too you know where hey we have this super secret ritual that only the in same thing in the greek orthodox church you know no one's it's it's basic mind control it's Cult training 101, secret society, secret ritual, only the knowing do it. Unnecessary. It's everywhere. The divine is right there on the tip of our nose, right? Why do we wanna why do we want to introduce unnecessary intermediary steps? Don't we want to disintermediate? So it, mm -hmm you stumble across it if you do it like you're doing it's good to be aware of it i understand that and and i understand the the power of metaphor that you're bringing forward but i guess i'm going to push back on I, I i think it's a misstep to suggest that well you're not suggesting it but i it, for someone to lead someone down a path to say hey this is a, a shortcut or this is like a good way to go it's like it misses the larger point of what you said so beautifully. Divinity is everywhere in everything when we talk about it from one particular perspective of the divinity of sexuality. Then do we tend to lose focus on the divinity of nature or the divinity of family or the divinity of just your ordinary washing the dishes? Oh, absolutely not. I just decided to focus on sexuality because there is so much darkness around it. So I said, okay, why don't I address it? Why don't I bring it into light? You know, because we cannot just uh, endlessly push it to the side and let the perverts, you know, practice it and so on. I just said, okay, so how can we look at it in a positive way that it, we can integrate it into our lives? But, but in no way I suggest that people should practice some tantric rituals, you know, especially some dark ones. I even don't practice them. I just had an experience that was very spontaneous and I didn't uh, uh, plan to do this. It just happens, you know, but maybe I studied it so much and, and I call it the act of grace. And because I experienced it in such a beautiful way, I believed I had to share it. You know, I chose to share it. Maybe I don't have to, but that doesn't mean that it takes away from anything else. I just couldn't, I cannot, it's a small book. I cannot write about everything, but you are very right. You can experience divinity in any way. So it doesn't have to be sexual way. I just say we cannot keep it in darkness because it didn't mean us. And I think that the, the secret powers that you're talking about you know, they, they want to do, demean this part. Like they wanted to demean, for example, Mary Magdalene and other goddesses. And then the, my question is why? There must be some liberating power in it and we have to claim it, but in our own way, not through darkness, but through light. But you're absolutely right. I wouldn't advise anyone just, you know, use some sexual um, rituals, you know, to, to get high on consciousness because this is not uh, what it is about. And, and I, I certainly don't want to misrepresent your book because your book doesn't come across like that at all. I mean, it is extremely positive and affirming and giving us new ways of understanding the human condition that is mm -hmm. sexuality and female sexuality that there's so much legitimacy to, you know, in the in, in this cancel culture that we live in and in this transhumanist culture that we live in, which is denying the feminine as a, as a kind of roundabout twisted, other twisted way, right? So, you know, we can look at Aleister Crowley and twisting sexuality into its kind of the, the, the dark left-hand path of it. But then we have the other, and you even touch this, touch on this in the book and your chapter on technology. I don't know if you go all the way to the transhumanist stuff, but 
maybe you want to speak to that because that's another way of twisting and distorting this sexuality is to completely to deny it and to do you know the rapper who identifies as a woman for 30 minutes so he can set the deadlifting record and then identifies back as a man i thought that was well played but it, it gets at this deeper thing of what's going on in terms of trying to twist our understanding of who we are as as human beings that's an excellent statement alex so perhaps i would maybe start explaining but i'm not even talking about uh, women and men i'm talking about masculine and feminine energies and i'm very jungian about it so i mean like we have we both have you know masculine and feminine energies animus and anima within us and i think that so it's not against men by any means you know i love men i i love my you know husband and so on but what i'm saying is that this i civilization and i don't think it was a natural movement i think it was a control movement by someone you know that uh, that we moved too much in one direction which is this kind of rational type of mind you know which is very logical which is very cause and effect which is very technological which takes us now to transhumanism which i think is very scary you know i think transhumanism is something that we really have to consider nowadays and that we somehow on the way, and I think it was systematic, this other, which I call feminine, but both men and women have it, form of intelligence, of consciousness was consciously repressed by someone. And this intelligence shows us the, you know, unity of everything, the divinity in everything that you were talking about, and perhaps completely different way of evolving without, you know, a neuraling in your mind which I think actually is completely evil and it it will I worry that it may stop a spiritual evolution although personally I believe that spiritual practice can overcome anything but it is an, another obstacle let's put it so I think that this form of intelligence which unfortunately we call masculine but I prefer to call it logical or this rational mind which okay it gave us some you know good things and tools and so on but it's extremely limiting and it's not serving us anymore and we are taking it way too far and we are forgetting this other form of energy which is you can call it goddess consciousness or some people are more comfortable with christ consciousness this more holistic way of perceiving things which focuses on spirit and the divinity of everything and we left it behind so part of the book is looking into this you know wh why why all of this whoever represents this uh, this other consciousness, why they were pushed to a side. And I'm not saying even that all of these goddesses were great or anything like that, but um, they are represented often, as you know, in the book as, as, uh, as kind of uh, guardians before different portals between death and life, between, uh, you know, evolution, you know, or going from tra transcendence. You know, they, they hold the, the, the reed, which is supposed to be a form of a portal that one of the goddesses, you know, is always portrayed with, and most of them, including Mary Magdalene, then you think like the, we lost something on the way. And in fact, I think that it was uh, intentionally repressed and demean, and we have to reclaim it because we completely are going in the wrong direction. And, you know, transhumanism, I agree with you. This is a super scary stuff. And, and and I hope we will never go there, but I think it is probably unless there is some technological disaster, some war, some some people ho hope for some solar flare or something destroys that. But if it doesn't happen, you know, we have to uh, we have to deal with this. And I think we have to use our spiritual tools. You know, this is the only way we have to use our spiritual tools. You know, I, I got to say, I kind of appreciated the I don't know woman's perspective in the book and that and uh and really bring it because i i get what you're saying you know the it's not just about women versus men and there's the divinity and feminine and masculine but it's like no to, hats off to you for coming and saying you know hey really understand at this deeper spiritual level what goes along with being a woman on this journey and especially from a historical perspective because that's what mary magdalene gives us and that's what these other goddesses give us and there mm -hmm. is there you, you're there are differences okay are, you know yeah. there are differences and you're talking about those differences and then you're talking about how they 
play in this theater that we're in. So I thought that was great. And I think when we contrast that with the transhumanist agenda and the technocrat agenda, um, the, 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 it really draws clear the lines there. And it, it there's this cultural part of it that is kind of a, a joke that's been going on in academia for the longest time, the wokeness kind of thing and the political correctness thing. And that's one path. And then there's this transhumanist path that I think really caught a lot of people by surprise in just saying, well, it's about ET. And you two talk Diana Bosch Pasolko, we'll have to talk about her. Uh, you know, it's kind of ET, it's the Matrix, it's the, uh, you know, uh, cyborg kind of thing, it's Elon Musk, and you're going to be neurolinked. It's all that stuff is just coming at us. And at the same time, people are still recovering from the political correctness woke stuff. And I wonder what you think about, about some of that. You know, I, I always kind of thought that the you know, go woke, go broke thing is so true. But what a lot of people didn't see is it's also true spiritually. Go woke, go broke spiritually. You know what I mean? If everything is relativism, if there is nothing to stand on, then how do you connect with that moral imperative that really drives spirituality, the decision to do the right thing, to be good? Uh, that that doesn't come that doesn't work if well everything is relative everyone hasn't there's really no right or wrong and you know mitch horowitz kind of thing uh you know i i, I just what do you think about that the wokeness well it is actually a very confusing topic because on the, I have conversations with my mother, who is, you know, obviously much more conservative and it's just way too much for her, right? And, and I was trying to explain that perhaps some of us, some of us, and you probably disagree, is that some people who were different in any way, so for example, if you were gay or, you know, you, or they, they had no voice in society. They had to pretend who they are. So now they, they claim the identity and I think that's appropriate. And I think that sometimes possibly, and it's just a matter of balance, if, you know, they go maybe too far because they said, you know, you know we were repressed for, forever and now we are, look at me and this is what we do. And, you know, they, they try to shock you because they want the acceptance and, you know, and, and that's appropriate. However, the whole thing about, and maybe there, and I think there is, I'm probably exposing myself for so much criticism. There is a probably a small, number of people that feel you know that they are wrong person in a wrong body i have no experience with this but from what i read it's you know probably a small part of population and the rest i am just very skeptical and maybe very even shocked or i don't want to say shocked but amazed in a way like what's going on so uh, again, I'm going to say something that is probably very controversial, but I think a man identifying as a woman and participating in women's sports and destroying it, I cannot support it. Why do we have to kind of put people to a test like that? I mean, it's ridiculous to even say, okay, Dr. Joanna, what do you think about that particular issue? It, it doesn't matter. I think you, the path through this is, as you said, is the spiritual path is that mm -hmm. everything is divine. So mm -hmm. to the extent that you think God made a mistake with your body, okay, maybe God made a mistake with your body. We don't know, but it's still your journey. It's your journey to figure out one way or another. It's not the state's journey. It's not the medical industry's journey. It's your personal spiritual journey. So all the rest of it is just bullshit. And I think that I I'm with you in terms of the way that it's manufactured and the way that it's elevated and put in our face and, and pushed to the front of consciousness and social issues is highly, highly suspect because it just isn't that controversial in the same way that it isn't controversial to say that women were treated horribly by our culture for the longest time. My, you know, my generation, my, immediately before my mother, she was very artistic. She was very creative. She had no options. 
be a secretary, be a nurse, be a teacher. That was it. That's not right. We don't need a women's studies department to tell us that isn't right. We need a connection with the divinity to see it all around us and to see that she was a, leading a rich spiritual life and that she should be able to do that in the way that she thought. So it does seem, and, and that is, uh, it does seem manufactured and it does seem to be primarily a social engineering control project, political operation project, rather than a genuine kind of thing, in my opinion. You know, I think that it perhaps is the same what happened, for example, to Christianity, which means, you know, there is a, and I don't know what's wrong with our social structures throughout human history that, you know, we know of human history because it's probably longer than, you know, academics and archaeologists tell us. But it starts with the original white hot experience, spiritual experience, like, you know, as people around Jesus had, you know, which is experience of Christ consciousness and so on. And then the structures, the social structures take control of it and it becomes this thing <laughs> that, you know, now we're talking like Catholic church or any church really, you know, and or any religion, because, you know, I went through the journey, you think you go to another religion and it's better there, you know, and then just stay there long enough and you see the same abuse, right? But, and the same brainwashing. But, so I think this is what happened probably with, uh, you know, what you call walk movement, that there, there was a genuine, I think, desire to express, you know, I, I deserve to be loved and accepted in society like everyone else, just because, you know, I'm not in the majority sexually or with my sexual orientation or with my choices, I deserve it. And that we have to respect, but then, and I completely respect it, you know, and these people imagine like being transgender or, you know, gay, even like hundred years ago, never mind, you know? So, 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 so this has to be acknowledged. These people should have voice, but then somebody's using it the way that Christ original teachings of every great being, you know, Jesus, Buddha, or whatever avatars, or, you know, how they in, embodied in, in, in human consciousness were used by, you know, this, what you call social engineering, which is actually very astutely put. And, and the question is, you know, Yes, it's definitely used because it's blown out of proportion. Instead of, you know, like individual respect for everybody's differences, it turned into this weird thing, which actually, in my personal opinion, is actually deme demeaning the original impulse. You know, I just want to be loved and accept. And it's made into this weird social thing. The, the other thing that I've run into, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this, because you have spent so much time within the religious academic community is that they have to kind of take part of the blame for this because you are so beautifully spiritually first you put spirituality at the center and then everything comes out of that religious studies has for the longest time got away with putting spirituality in the back seat or not even in the in the bus you know spirituality is like the fundamental question like another another survey question i asked you consciousness <laughs> and you went the the you know it's a scientific question you went again with the right answer max planck consciousness is fundamental everything is consciousness and it grows off of that i remember a few years ago i this guy becomes He's such a good guy, a tantric guy too. He's interested in tantric studies and stuff like that, but he gets kicked around on this show for the one appearance that he made. His name is Hugh Urban, religious studies, Ohio State University, respected professor, wrote a book on Scientology. And what I really picked on him about is he tells the now famous story about L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology and Jack Parsons out in the desert doing the sex magic ritual horror babylon thing to bring forth the antichrist and uh, again uh alistair crowley connection again that guy gets a lot of play but the point is that the way that hugh urban processed it is the way that he is forced to process it by his religious studies department at ohio state university and that is I don't know if it's true. I don't know if there's anything to it, but they believed it. 
and that's what's most important. And I'm like, no, dude, you got to get exactly opposite. The first and foremost question is, is there some possibility that it is real in some way? Does consciousness really exist? Does it extend beyond our being into this other dimension? That is the first question to ask. We don't skip over that question and say, well, they believed it. Let's just process all this from some kind of sociology. People get together and do things stuff. Hasn't, how does religious studies get by with such nonsense of dropping the ball and not being spirit first? Even if they're, even if you're atheist, you can be spirit first and you can say, well, I, damn it, I'm an atheist and I am before, but before I can go any further, I have to establish whether or not my philosophical belief in the biological robot and a meaningless universe, there is no consciousness. I have to decide whether that's true. So mm -hmm. you decide if it's true, it's obviously true, but religious studies seems to just kind of sidestep it, which seems completely ridiculous. No, that's actually very, very fair statement and a question. So I, I must say, I agree with you. It is very, so I would do positive and negatives for, for academia. So I agree with you. It is extremely limiting. And very early in my, even before I was an academic, I realized that academia and this kind of rational search, because again, academia is completely committed to uh, this rational part of mind, logic, you know, Aristotelian and Carthesian, you know. So it is, I, which I consider very limiting. And especially when you study religion and spirituality, it is very disappointing because they, they deal with only artificial, mental, uh, rational models right they do not deal with real spiritual experience although nowadays it's changing i must say you know i also you know participate in some uh, writing papers that you know how to see spiritual experience but i had a similar experience because uh, academically some years ago I was writing about spiritual experiences and spiritual journeys you know and so on why people you know have to sometimes leave their house to have a spiritual experience and so on and 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 i was like such a lonely figure <laughs> You know, I'm not anymore because these people thought I was a complete lunatic, you know, like so uh, uh, career wise, it was a suicide because it, on academia is all very mechanistic. You know, how many mentions, how many people you get, you know, in other people's papers, you go on academia.com and, you know, this is a and, and, and nobody was really interested when I was talking about spiritual experience. And only some years later, I met a few academics who actually write about it but not in a, again, in a very limiting way very often, right? Because spiritual experience, we have to come back to we, what we discussed previously, does it fit in into this kind of materialistic, rational mind frame? And this is how academics operate. This is just another structure. It's another social structure, academia. It's not necessarily, it's definitely not about the pursuit of wisdom. It is more about, you know, categorizing things. Right. So other people who did presentations at this conference would say, why people travel for pilgrimages? Ah, because this, 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 it has to be like in categories. Nobody wanted to say, well, maybe they want a spiritual experience and we should ask what it is. But, you know, they thought I was a lunatic because I was insisting on something that, you know, they thought it's just useless. So, so unfortunately, these are very serious limitations of uh, academia. And I realized that and it was very frustrating for me. One good thing about academia, especially in a, such a luminous topic, you know, uh, like spirituality, is that they do check their sources. And when I started to look into the alternative traditions, like, okay, I'm going to be controversial again. How many in, you know, embodiments of Mary Magdalene can happen on planet Earth at the moment? And everybody gets a channel and everybody. And I actually was trying to be very democratic. So when people were writing to me, I believe that I'm an embodiment of Mary Magdalene. But I heard that there are others. Do you think it's possible? And I said, sure, maybe, you know, you connected to some consciousness and it speaks through you. And they would get upset with me because they want to be the only ones, you know. So I think, OK. So what academia good is extremely limiting because it deals only with one form, really limiting form of consciousness, but at least they check their sources. So what it, academia taught me is discernment. You know what I mean? Like, okay. A very limited so, form of discernment, but yeah. A yeah. very limited yeah. form of discernment, but some discernment, like 
okay, I can, I, I honor your spiritual experience, but you know, certain things, and I write especially in my book about one popular spiritual teacher in this area, but I think he makes such jumps sometimes. And I think like, honestly, you know, like uh, maybe, maybe it is true for you, but you know, I, here I'm just going to be skeptical because, you know, I have no judgment, you know, because he didn't do anything wrong. You know, he didn't rape children or anything. So if it works for you, but you know, honestly, no. So, so, but yes, academia is extremely limiting and they do not even talk with, not even with a long stick, you know, <laughs> spiritual experience. So you are correct. Well, you know, one of the strengths of your book is that you do go cross culture with the goddesses immediately, yeah, from the beginning. So talk about that, talk about the other goddesses that come into play and how you play off the Mary Magdalene thing and how you find these other threads that turn out to be incredibly powerful because when you do weave them together, it's pretty hard to argue with the thesis that you're kind of bringing forward. Actually, it came from my own spiritual experience again, because uh, as you know, I was uh, moved towards esoteric Hinduism. And then I went back to Mary Magdalene through, through Gnostic teachers, teachings. And I just realized, you know, that there, are cert there are certain symbolisms, you know, that the same goddesses represent the same powers, that they're representing the same symbols, that they're all dressed in red, that they use this, there is a skull there, which is actually the image for transcendence and so on and i started to ask myself the question you know could they ex basically uh be a metaphor or representation of this different form of spiritual consciousness that we we're speaking about right because there are all of the similarities between hindu goddesses there's for example goddess radha you know who is portrayed exactly with, uh, goddess radha but actually goddess sundari even more so who is or even goddess Kali, which is, you know, can be shadowy, can be redeeming. It's, you know, it's most controversial of them. She's also considered a goddess of, uh, you know, a tantric goddess. Uh, they have the same symbolism, you know, they the same color, the, the, the same, uh, uh, the, the same elements around them, you know, the same flowers, the rose, you know, the, the red color, the skull, you know, the, the, the passage between death and life. So it, these similarities are very difficult to ignore. So you do cover that extensively, but you also cover other goddesses that people run across, uh, Aphrodite, Isis. Yeah. You, you yeah. weave those into the story too, which I think is powerful because you remind us why this archetype is an archetype and how it does speak to us. And I, I back to that other point, how it speak to us speaks seems to speak to us differently if we're a man or a woman. And I think that's a that's a good thing. So men can kind of grow a little bit and women can kind of feel empowered a little bit that hey, this isn't something new that we just cooked up. That's right. And I think you know I think that we are, you know, in this reality in which we live we are caught in polarities but you know some polarities are beautiful such as like being a woman and being a man for example right and and you know the beautiful energy and chemistry and i talk also about erotic connection in my book that can happen because of this and then i also don't want to be limiting here to men and women you know whatever it is you know this male and female energies playing together and and i think we are here for a reason in this particular way. And these polarities actually allow us to transcend themselves as well. You know, there are also tools, you know, and, and maybe not everything has to be so terribly serious. And some of the gods, especially the ancient Greek gods, I just had a recently different interview and we agreed, you know, they showed us how to be playful. You know, they were not particularly, you know, responsible, right? They were really like spoiled celebrities. But, you know, like an, an Aphrodite, I just talked about it, where she lost her power and so on. But, you know, they were very charismatic and, and, and they were, and, and they had lots of fun, you know? So this is part of this as well. And how to be empowered as a woman and how to be empowered as a man in, in, in an uplifting, you know, and a, an attractive way, so to speak, right? So, so, so we can play with these polarities. Uh, awesome! I love the way that you put that. So, it, there's there's a lot to this book. The other thing people will find is it's a beautiful book. I mean, just looking at it, it's just the art. I think 
you can see on the cover, but then even in the pages, you know, are done. So what, what do you think about beauty as we do associate beauty more with the, this feminine energy? What was your thought in making a book like this that looks like this? Beauty is very important for me. I think I am kind of naturally, and it's not even an intellectual choice. I'm naturally tuned into beauty and I see beauty in many things, you know, so even in, we have a very small garden and, you know, and I see beauty everywhere. So that's very important for me. And that's part of the reason why, uh, and I think beauty is a form of transcendence, you know, as long as we, again, do not demean it into some special attributes. So, uh, so when I was writing this book, I, when I was writing this book, I wanted to be very readable, you know, so I didn't want it to, to write an academic book for many reasons. And I want, and I hope for this, that, you know, it would be very pleasant reading because I associate beauty also not only with transcendence, but also with sensual pleasure, right? So I, I hoped that this book would be that. And as far as for cover, I want to thank Shiloh Sophia, who is a, an artist from California, a very prolific artist, who you know offered her painting for this book, and I actually you know was looking at different paintings, and then I was in meditation, and I ac actually asked the book, "What face would you like to have?" And you know, and I reached out to several artists, and you know, this one came right through, and I actually gave Shiloh, Sophia, you know, different paintings. Which one would you be you know be willing? And she said that one, and I thought, okay. So the book wants to have this face, you know? So I decided it's, it's not me anymore. It's, you know, now it has its own life. It's almost like a child, right? It has its own life and it wanted to have this beautiful face and, and, and this is what it is. So I think beauty is very important as a form of transcendence and spiritual experience. You know, Plato also wrote about it in his dialogue, but it doesn't have to be called kind of Apollonian beauty. It can be also a form of sensual beauty, experiencing this consciousness, this divine in simple things like, uh, in life, you know, just like being in a garden or, you know, making love with someone, you know, that matters to you. How wonderful. How wonderful. Okay, so any other thoughts about the book? stuff that we haven't covered and and where do you plan to go from here with it do you have another book in mind are you working on something else no not at the moment because at the moment i'm just enjoying the process and the the whole writing of a book was a form of liberation for me because i realized as i was writing this book and decided to write it this way that a as you mentioned it is full of self-exposure in a very intimate part of your life my life but also you know, that I was a complete slave to the social engineering before because I, for all my life, I was completely obsessed with what my academic friends think. And I was also a part of a literary kind of elite, you know, because they like to <laughs> call themselves like that. And they thought that I completely lost my mind as well, like my academic colleagues. And then I decided I just don't care anymore. You know, that's my expression of my freedom and of my spirituality. And my spirituality, spirituality looks like that, you know, and it's not that it has to look like that. It's just my experience of it. So at the moment, I'm just enjoying the process, like, you know, this interview. Uh, I think after that, uh, I will take some, a break, you know, because I will need some rest. And if I write another book, it probably would be about consciousness about this other form of consciousness, right? So, because it just kind of naturally evolved into this, but could not be a part of this book because, you know, it's a, just a different book. <laughs> well, in, in so many ways, you've written a beautiful, beautiful book about consciousness because that is that is ultimately what it's about. Um, our guest again has been Dr. Joanna Cueva. The book that you're going to want to check out, The Other Goddess, been awesome. You know, I loved every part of this. I loved talking with you beforehand, connecting, studying it, thinking about it. The book was, it really sent me on a journey. You know, I remember I was just mentioning to my wife, she goes, well, what are you interviewing? I go, this woman who's an academic written a book on goddess, it's goddess energy or goddesses. And she's like, she perked right up. She goes, oh, God, I like that. You know, and it just... <laughs> Even that little bit, though, it just connected me with that divide that is there, that 
because we live in a male-dominated culture, back to the kind of reality of the wokeness kind of thing, which we did need wokeness in a way. We're both saying that, you know, we can't deny it, is that men especially can really benefit from this book because it it does in a very genuine way ask you to look at a different perspective in a different way, in a way that that you do have a way of, of kind of getting there with some of the things that you mentioned that, you know, we have heard about before. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. Thanks again to Joanna for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up from this interview is, how do you understand this relationship between sexuality and spirituality? And isn't it awesome that she's written a book about this? I think it is awesome. And I think her point about how we've let darkness dominate the discussion of sexuality is really an awesome, awesome point. There, I've answered the question, which I usually try not to do, but I went ahead and did it. What's your thoughts on it? Let me know. Best place, Skeptical Forum. I wish you all would come over there. It's getting pretty lonely. Until next time, take care and bye for now.